Good afternoon. Now, we had uh, Mr. Jairam Ramesh here with us a few months ago. In fact, I think that was one of his first uh, public appearances after becoming minister. And I said then that uh, after many, many years, India has a proper environment and forest minister. Really a long, long time, maybe after 10, 12 years. And in the last few months, he's uh, proved me right, been active, I think proactive, uh, not only domestically, but also internationally. Been very involved in the Copenhagen talks, in the consultations, particularly with China. Um, in the room in Copenhagen, from all accounts, not from him, but maybe he'll say something to us about that, when President Obama was closeted with these four or five countries, you know, the most articulate English-speaking person in the room was Jairam. So I think he was a, a principal spokesperson for the five countries uh, negotiating with the president and his team. So I asked him whether he would come and speak to a you know, wider audience, um, share what he's been doing domestically. Uh, a couple of days ago, he did an outstanding presentation to a group of CEOs, corporate, uh, the main board of uh, CII, and he left them in no uncertain terms that you know they have a, also a lot to do. They are doing a lot in India, actually more than many other countries, but they also have a lot to do. And uh, as he was leaving, I mentioned to him that there is a new campaign and a new fund which has been created in India, Remove Jairam Fund, <laughs> so he, because he's become such a proactive environment minister. And lots of vested interests and uh, lots of people are feeling a little insecure and threatened. But um, I'm delighted. Aspen is delighted, CII is delighted to have someone like him leading this because there's so much to do within our own country. Um, and I think he's going to speak about that. He's going to also speak about uh, what he's been doing internationally. Jairam, thank you for coming. Over to you. Thank you, Tarun. I thought uh, the focus is going to be exclusively on Copenhagen. So maybe I should, looking at the audience, focus largely on what happened in Copenhagen and the next steps in 2010, and perhaps towards the end, talk about the domestic agenda, which is really much more fundamental and much more important. First of all, uh, let me say that the Copenhagen conference clearly did not meet anybody's expectations. Uh, and uh, everybody who was associated with it uh, came away disappointed at the outcome. I think uh, in terms of the actual substantive accomplishments of the conference, quite clearly, there were two main outcomes of the conference. The first was the mandate for continued negotiations on what the negotiators understand to mean the two-track process which is negotiations for long-term cooperative action, which involve all countries, and negotiations for the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol, the post-2012 commitments of the Annex I countries, which is the developed countries, minus the United States. So the first substantial accomplishment of Copenhagen was uh, to give a mandate uh, to bring negotiations on both these tracks uh, to an end by December 2010 uh, when we will meet in Mexico. I think uh, we are there quite substantially. I would say that the negotiating texts on both these tracks that were in front of us, maybe about 65% there. There are still a large number of square brackets, footnotes, slashes, which have to be removed in the course of 2010, 
but I'm quite optimistic that that will happen. So this is the multilateral accomplishment of Copenhagen. There was, of course, the second accomplishment, which is not a multilateral accomplishment. It was a plurilateral accomplishment of 29 countries, which signed up to what has now come to be known as the Copenhagen Accord, which, uh, for a variety of reasons having to do with process and not with substance, could not be adopted by the 194 countries of the UNFCCC, uh, got derailed on questions relating to process and procedure, and therefore was only taken note of by the Conference of Parties. So on the one hand, you have a multilateral accomplishment of continued negotiations to bring negotiations on the two tracks to a close by December 10, and you have a plurilateral accomplishment in a 29 country accord which was taken note of and which barring such giants of the world economy as Cuba, Bolivia, Nicaragua, Venezuela and a couple of other countries, Sudan included perhaps, most countries comfortable with the substance of the accord but clearly uncomfortable with the way the accord was arrived at. And I'll have something to say on that a little later. So this is the primary accomplishment of Copenhagen. Now, as I've already said, on the negotiating process itself, the negotiations will begin very soon, and there'll be a mid-year stock taking in Bonn sometime in the end of May, and we hope that we would bring these negotiations to a close, the multilateral negotiations to a close by December 2010. But the real interesting animal that emerged out of Copenhagen is the Copenhagen Accord. It's not anchored in a multilateral setting, quite clearly. And that is its fundamental weakness. But it will have an influence on the multilateral negotiations. Because many of the contentious issues on the multilateral track were actually settled as part of the Copenhagen Accord. And I would imagine and I would expect that the 29 countries who were present when this accord was being negotiated, of which India was one, are not going to suddenly disown the accord. We are signatories to the accord. I mean, we're not signatories in the formal sense. But we have negotiated this accord in good faith and we expect that this accord will have an influence on the multilateral negotiations. But ultimately, we are interested in strengthening the multilateral process of negotiations with all its imperfections and all its frustrations. Now, on the Copenhagen Accord itself, it is quite clear that by now, that this accord was made possible entirely because of the negotiations that took place between the President of the United States and the group of four, the Gang of Four, also called the Basic Countries, Brazil, South Africa, India, and China. And I think if there is one outstanding outcome of Copenhagen in terms of international diplomacy, in terms of international power equations, it is the emergence of these four countries as a cohesive group. BASIC was not a Copenhagen invention. BASIC had already existed in the past. But in the run-up to Copenhagen, largely because of the efforts of China and India, BASIC acquired a structure a sense of cohesion, a sense of purpose. And on the 27th and 28th of October, the basic ministers had met in Beijing to formulate their strategy for Copenhagen, something that has, had not been done before. 
and that strategy was reflected in a Copenhagen outcome which was actually drafted in Beijing and this solidarity and commonality in approach continued through the Copenhagen period of December 7th to December 18th itself. The solidarity was not just at the negotiating level, but obviously it emanated from an understanding between the, amongst the heads of state, Prime Minister Wen Jiabao, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, President Zuma, and President Lula. Now, there were three issues on which the Copenhagen Accord, which was negotiations for which began on the 17th of December, by 5 p.m. on the 18th of December, it was clear that the Copenhagen Accord was, had reached an impasse and President Obama would have to go back without a piece of paper. It was then that the meeting that took place between President Obama and the basic countries acquired its own importance. And there were three issues on which the accord was floundering. The negotiations for the accord were floundering. The first issue related to what the global goal should be for the year 2050. Should it be expressed in terms of a limit in the increase of temperature, which was the stand of the basic countries? Or should it be expressed in terms of a percentage reduction in emissions, which was the European position? Or should it be expressed in terms of parts per million of CO2 concentrations, which was the position of the small island states, the 43 small island states, led by Maldives, Grenada, and other such countries, joined by Bangladesh. So this was the first issue. What should be the global goal? The second contentious issue was what should be the regime for monitoring and verification of mitigation actions undertaken by the larger developing countries, Brazil, South Africa, but most notably China and India. Remember that China is today the world's largest emitter, 23% of world greenhouse gas emissions. India comparatively much lower, knocking at 5%, but still in absolute terms, the world's fifth largest emitter. And by 2020, every prospect of becoming the world's fourth largest emitter at about 8 to 8.5% 8 world share. So the second issue was how what should be the regime, what should be the system for monitoring, verifying those actions of the developing countries who don't have any legal obligations today. And the third issue was what should be the characteristic of the Copenhagen Accord? Should it be a legally binding agreement, which is what the Europeans wanted, or should it be a framework for discussion and negotiation, which is what the basic group was desiring? Now, these were three issues which had been discussed in the hall. There was no agreement between the basic group and the other countries. And here I might just share with you a very interesting tidbit that the only two countries not represented by their heads of state during these negotiations were India and China. Everybody else was there and part of the frustration of the developed world was that they were negotiating with the Minister of State of India and a Vice Minister who unfortunately has got shifted yesterday 
uh, from China. Otherwise, you had President Obama for most of the time, Sarkozy all the time, Angela Merkel all the time, Gordon Brown all the time, Kevin Rudd all the time, President Calderon of Mexico all the time, Hatayama for almost 75% of the time, President Lula was there maybe about 40 to 45% of the time, and President Zuma also was there about 40 to 45% of the time. But the Indian Prime Minister and the Chinese Premier were not there in the actual negotiation for the Copenhagen Accord. For the nitty obviously they were quarterbacking this from wherever they were. So these were the three issues that had led to the impasse and it was at 6 o'clock on the 18th that the four heads of state of the basic countries met to decide what to do because clearly the intention of the Europeans and the United States was to announce a breakdown of Copenhagen and hold the four basic countries responsible for the breakdown. In fact, one statement of President Obama, which has not got the publicity it should deserve, which summarized the American approach to Copenhagen. During the negotiations, he turned to the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, and the President of Maldives, and told both of them that you're not going to get money unless these four guys sign up on the accord. And the money that was being promised was a hundred billion dollars a year to be mobilized by the year 2020. And very clearly, categorically, directly, President Obama said that any money flows to developing countries of Africa, Asia, is going to be linked to the accord being signed and these four countries coming on board. Basically, he was telling the Prime Minister of Bangladesh that you better tell your four compatriots to fall in line. And uh, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh did ask me that why India is going to deny Bangladesh this money. So she was also, the pressure was beginning to work on her. This was a line that was taken by Gordon Brown also, and also by the Australian Prime Minister. So this was in this background that this basic group heads of state met. Prime Minister Wen Jiabao was under great pressure to meet President Obama to settle the issue. The Chinese Prime Minister took the line that he will not meet President Obama alone, he'll meet him only with the other heads of state of the basic countries, which is a very interesting commentary on the way the Chinese approached <coughs> these negotiations. I'll say something about this also. So I, to cut a long story short, the four heads of state met and trying to figure out what's a good way of trying to break this impasse because none of the four heads of state wanted to be held responsible for the breakdown of Copenhagen. And the Chinese foreign minister came to me and said that, look, Bangladesh and Maldives are in touch with him and saying that, why is China proving to be such a difficult nut? I said, they've already been in touch with me on that score as well. So clearly, none of the four countries wanted to be held responsible for the breakdown. And the discussion was going on on how to approach this, what is to be done, how to grab the media space before it was grabbed by the advanced countries. It was then at roughly 7 p.m. that the President of the United States walked in, somewhat unannounced, unscheduled to this group of the basic meeting, the basic group meeting, and immediately got down to negotiating these three issues. The global goal issue, 
the monitoring issue and the legally binding issue. Now, the first issue on the global goal, very clearly he said, look, we have these 43 small island states who want the global goal to be expressed as 1.5 degrees Celsius, not 2 degrees Celsius. The Europeans want a 50% cut in global emissions by 2050. Some states want atmospheric CO2 concentrations to be limited to 350 parts per million. So why are you guys not going to relent? So we said that, no, we are one in saying that the global goal should be in terms of a limit of 2 degrees Celsius. Because the moment you say 50% cut for a global goal, and you already have determined what the cut for the developed countries should be, the residual is for the developing countries. So you have implicitly put a cap or a constraint on the growth path of the developing countries. And 1.5 degrees is clearly unrealistic because if, if all emissions were to stop today, if all countries were to stop emitting today, the increase would still be close to 2 degrees Celsius. So 1.5 is, is not a realistic target to begin with. So after about 10 minutes of discussion, President Obama said, all right, 2 degrees. So that was settled and it was settled in favor of the basic group. So the score was basic one, the United States and Europe zero. It's important because there are many people in this country who believe that, you know, we capitulated at Copenhagen. So I want to keep, you, keep giving you the scoring. The second issue was, I'll take the easier issue first. The second issue was the legal, the third issue, which I'm taking second today, is the legally binding nature of the commitment. So President Obama said, look, I'm indifferent to an international legally binding, whether this should be internationally legally binding right now, because I have my own battles on domestic law to fight, but the Europeans are insisting that this should be a legally binding accord. Or we must say somewhere that we will work towards a legally binding accord. He said, no. The only legally binding accord, as far as we are concerned, is the Kyoto Protocol. We recognize only the Kyoto Protocol. We will not be party to creating another legally binding instrument that would be seen as a substitute for the Kyoto Protocol. So we are not going to have any legally binding discussions. We will take on domestic obligations. We will do autonomous actions. We will do unilateral actions but we will not take them on in an internationally legally binding Kyoto type framework because we are not enjoined to do so under the UNFCCC or the Kyoto Protocol. I think it took Pro Pro President Obama less than three minutes to see our point of view on this and he said, all right, you guys win on this. The Europeans will not be very happy with me, but I will try to convince them. So the score was two to basic zero to the US and Europe. The third issue was the monitoring and verification issue. And here the issue was really between the United States and China. The crux of the issue was how do you bring some form of international monitoring on what China is doing on its own? And because it's 23% of world greenhouse gas emissions, Chinese emissions projected to grow even more impressively in future. So there must be some international system that measures, monitors, verifies what China is doing. It was not, India was not on the radar screen. Brazil was not on the radar screen. South Africa was not on the radar screen. It is really China. And President Obama started his discussions by saying, I will not accept any words, any formulation that does not include the words scrutiny, 
review, verify, assess. So he wanted verification or review and or review and or assessment and or very, uh, uh, scrutinize, verify, review and assess. These are the four words that President Obama said. Nothing else would be acceptable to him. The process of negotiations started. Our first offer was discussions. It was rejected by the Americans saying that discussions is too open-ended. There's no result at the end of discussions. Then it was dialogue. Dialogue was even more open-ended. You can keep on talking. You know. So dialogue was rejected. Then we said, all right, how about analysis, technical analysis? So what is technical analysis? So technical analysis is technical analysis. You don't ask questions on human rights record uh, when you come for GHG monitoring. You confine it to the technical aspects of GHG. said, no, it will never pass the U.S. Congress. So technical analysis was out. But analysis could stay. So there was some light at the end of the tunnel that the word analysis stayed. He said, why not analysis and assessment? So we said, no, assessment implies a certain value judgment, which we don't want to give as part of the Copenhagen Accord. So we were stuck on this. And frankly, uh, I've got to say this, I'm not dramatizing the situation, but the Americans were quite prepared to leave at this stage because there was no light at the end of the tunnel on how to break the impasse on the monitoring and verification issue. 45 minutes had elapsed. He had to f brief the Europeans, do his inevitable press conference, and then you know go away, take the flight back. Then he told the four or five Sherpas to go to the corner and try to figure out a way of resolving this impasse. So four or five of us went to the corner, tried various formulations, just was not acceptable to anybody. So finally, we said, how about consultations and analysis? Immediately, President Obama rejected it. He said, what's consultations? You, know, you just come, consult, it's like a picnic. He said. So then it was pointed out to the US that in the international economic scene, those of you who have dealt with international diplomacy, with the WTO, we have trade policy discussions and consultations. And those of you who have dealt with international economic diplomacy know that as part of the IMF, the Article 4 consultations, every country, including the United States, is subject to consultations on economic policy. So when this was pointed out to President Obama, to his everlasting credit, within 30 seconds, he said, all right, I buy consultations. If it's part of the international lexicon, I'll buy it. And that's how it became consultations and analysis. But there was still the sensitive issue of consultations and analysis being done. You know, 100 guys descending on a country and figuring out, now show me all your pipes where CO2 is coming out from. Let me measure, monitor them. What are you doing? So how to prevent this from happening? So we gave in line which said consultations and analysis based on international guidelines but done in a manner to respect national sovereignty. You know, national sovereignty is a word from the Soviet era. Nobody uses words like national sovereignty anymore. But the U.S. president bought this formulation. 
and the U.S. Secretary of State was sitting next to him, she bought this formulation. And that is how para 5 in the Copenhagen Accord reads consultations and analysis in a manner that respects national sovereignty. I don't think there's any agreement that the United States has entered into which has a line which says we will respect national sovereignty. So on this third issue, I would say the score was, I would give the basic countries got about 75%, 65 to 70%. The US got about 30%. So if you take all these three issues, global goal, monitoring, legally binding, I would say the score it'd be on favor of BASIC would be about two and a half, and the United States 0 0.5. Although in his press conference, in order to, I suppose, meet his domestic political obligations, President Obama and his pin doctors claimed the reverse ratio. I have no problem with that. You know. But the truth is, what I have told you, that the basic countries got away on two and a half, at least two and a half out of the three issues that were at the contentious point. And of course, then at the end of the meeting, President Obama said, I still have the more difficult task. It was nice negotiating with you guys. You guys have a charming bunch of people. Now I have to convince the Europeans. And that took much longer than expected. The Europeans, as was expected, were hopping mad. But ultimately, I think the power of the United States did sway them. And many Europeans came to me later on and said that we have done a deal behind their backs. And well, that was the way it was. Now, I think, frankly, Copenhagen saw the emergence of a new world order. I think it saw the emergence of a negotiating forum where countries were willing to be pragmatic, where countries had certain red lines which they didn't want to cross, but they were willing to engage in negotiations. And frankly, I think the lesson is, if you're evangelical, you can never negotiate. If you're evangelical on a positive sense, or even if you're evangelical on a negative sense, you're not going to get into a mood of negotiating, which inevitably involves discussion, engagement, give and take. I, I have said in Parliament, and I've been, you know, uh, criticized for it, saying that I did not go to Copenhagen with the words consultations and analysis. I went to Copenhagen thinking that we'll buy information. Yeah, it's changed. If I, if I didn't want to change my position, I could have just said it on a website or a fax and said, this is my position, take it or leave it. But that's not what international negotiations are all about. International negotiations means accepting your responsibility and trying to maximize the room for your maneuver while maintaining certain basic principles. And the basic principle that all the four basic countries adhered to was that whatever we do on our own, which is subject to international consultations and analysis, will be in a framework that respects national sovereignty. Now, what that framework is, is left for us to define now. And that's what we're going to spend the next couple of months doing. So I think at Copenhagen, we saw this parallel negotiating forum, the basic group and the United States, with clearly Europe in the background. And that, of course, did create problems with Europe. It created problems within the developing countries. And as I mentioned to you right at the beginning, the net result of it was that this was not an agreement that was adopted by the Conference of Parties. It was only noted by the Conference of Parties. Now, what next? What next? The negotiating of the multilateral process will begin and the process of multilateralizing the Copenhagen Accord will also begin. Because the challenge is to make the Copenhagen Accord part of the multilateral process. 
we are not creating a parallel UNFCCC. However frustrating it is, however time consuming it is, the fact is global governance depends on the buy-in of 194 countries in this case. And I think entirely because of the inadequacy, inadequacies of the conference president, namely Denmark, we, faced with, we were faced with this situation of a process that was non-transparent, of a process that was not conducted in the best possible manner to ensure a wider degree of acceptance and consensus. However, all that is history now. And I think now, of course, the big challenge is to ensure that the Copenhagen Accord is used in a manner that helps the multilateral negotiations to be concluded by December 2010. Because there are many issues, the global goal issue is settled in the Copenhagen Accord. The monitoring issue is settled in the Copenhagen Accord. The legally binding nature of this new instrument is settled in the Copenhagen Accord because it does not mention them. So, as far as I'm concerned, as far as the basic countries are concerned, we are looking at how we can use this accord creatively to strengthen the multilateral negotiating process. We are going to continue the basic stream between the 20th and 25th of this month. The basic ministers are going to meet in New Delhi. Hopefully the fog will clear by then. And we are We've got an in-principle approval by the basic ministers, and we're trying to fix out the exact date. But between the 28th and 25th of this month, we are hoping to have a basic ministerial group meeting here. And we will take stock of where we are and see what more requires to be done to give this operational meaning. To, as far as the multilateral negotiating track is concerned, how to breathe life into Kyoto, which remains really the, the Troika, the, the UNFCCC, the Kyoto Protocol, and the Bali Action Plan. Now, as far as India is concerned, just a couple of very brief comments on what next for India. I've talked to you about what next for as far as the world level is concerned. I think quite clearly the one lesson that I was saying from day one, but which was strengthened in Copenhagen, is that we must negotiate from a position of strength. We must negotiate from a position of action, not from a defensive position. Not from a position of what we will, what we will not do, but from a position of what we are going to do, or what we have done. And clearly there here the agenda is domestic. Just this morning we have set up, the Government of India has set up, the Planning Commission has set up an expert group to prepare a roadmap for a low carbon economy. This word low carbon was not used in India six years, six months ago. It was taboo to use the word low carbon. But today we have set up an expert group to prepare at a sectoral level what should be the strategy for moving into a low-carbon low growth strategy. We have a National Action Plan on Climate Change, which has promised a number of initiatives, whether it's the solar mission, whether it's the energy efficiency mission. All these now have to be put into operation. All these must be implemented and not remain on paper. We must transform actions into outcomes. We are great at providing information on actions. World's greatest producers of actions, but perhaps the world's lousiest producer of outcomes. So we have to take this national action plan and give it operational outcome oriented meaning, whether it's in solar energy, renewable energy, whether it is in the area of energy efficiency, or whether it is in some other areas of sustainable habitat, sustainable agriculture, and all the other missions that have been promised in the action plan. I think that is going to give us 2010, the leadership role. 
I was just, just before coming here, I was with Professor Bhagwati, Jagdish Bhagwati, who was telling somebody that for the first time in an international negotiation, India was seen to be pro-solution. I think that's an important gain for us at Copenhagen. We were seen to be part of the solution. We were seen to be part of a group wanting a solution. We didn't get the perfect solution. We didn't get the solution that we wanted or all we desired, but we got somewhere. And we must now keep this momentum going and always be seen to be part of the solution. Remember, at the WTO and at Doha, we were seen to be part of the problem. We were not seen to be part of the solution. And I think this is the big challenge. We have a convention on biodiversity coming up, equally important international negotiations like climate change that is going to culminate at Nagoya in Japan the end of October. We're going to have we will be called upon to play a similar leadership role in this regard. But the leadership role comes not because we are a one billion people. Leadership role will come only on the strength of our economic performance and on the strength of what we are doing at home. If we have a poor environmental record at home, which we have, we are not going to be in a position to influence the international environmental discourse. The only way we are influencing the international discourse is by drawing reference to Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, that has to, you know, that is an important element of what we are doing. But we have to understand that if you want the world to listen to us, you've got to be in a position to be showing to the world that you're doing something substantive and meaningful. And that's the big challenge for us specifically in this area of climate change, but in the larger area of environmental management as well. So I think I'll stop here and maybe take some questions. I just summarize by saying that what I said in Parliament, that such international negotiations are full of threats, are full of hazards. They're also full of opportunities. And the difference between us and the Chinese is that I think the Chinese have learned to operate at multiple levels. And they are already decided strategically that 10 years from now, they are going to be the world's leading player in green technology. Today, four of the world's leading solar companies, the Chinese company. China today has the world's largest wind energy program. Chinese companies are selling supercritical coal-based power generation technology. Not unheard of five years ago, six years ago. The Chinese negotiate tough internationally, but aggressively implement their own agendas domestically to be in a position, in this case, to be a major player in the technology sphere. And I see 10 years from now, not the United States, not Japan, not Germany, but I really see China to be the driver of the green economy. And I think this is a business opportunity for us that we need to seize. We have perhaps greater entrepreneurial skills in this country than the Chinese have. But we need to accept this as a challenge. Already in some areas, we are at the cutting edge. The world's fifth largest wind energy company is an Indian company. We have a large number of Indian companies now entering the field of solar fabrication and manufacturing. And in many other areas, Indian companies are really at the frontier of technology. So I feel that if we view this as a business opportunity, we will be in a position to dictate the terms of the international discourse. We have, of course, to ensure that the inherent hazards, the inherent threats that are always there will be negotiated, will be managed. We are not in a position to take on internationally legally binding targets, and that will remain our position. 
But we have to make this clear why we are not going to take on internationally legally binding targets. But for not taking on internationally legally binding targets, we must be prepared to be ruthless domestically. And that's why I have been saying repeatedly that while we reject international legally binding treaties in climate change, we should be prepared to have domestically legally binding legislation and laws accountable to our own parliament. Why not? It's in our interest. And there are many areas, transportation, industry, power generation, forestry, agriculture, buildings, which, for which you can take domestic accountability through laws, through legislation. And that will force a culture of performance, a culture of discipline on ourselves. And that would also give a measure of confidence to the world that we take our domestic obligations very seriously. So I think it's in this background that we should view Copenhagen. It is a major watershed event in my view because of the emergence of a new set of negotiating players and I'm sure that what has started as part of climate change will begin to be seen in other areas as well, whether it's international trade, whether it's biodiversity, whether it is international financial architecture. I think these are the areas that are crying out for similar pragmatic approaches. And I'm sure that the lesson that we derive from the Copenhagen process is that there is merit to being positive. There is merit to being proactive. There is merit to being part of the solution and not always being the naysayers, which has been our traditional impression and traditional image. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very comprehensive and a very serious um, statement on Copenhagen and India's uh, I think the new mindset and the new attitude, the new strategy in international negotiations and also spelling out what uh, we need to do in India. Um, we are very deeply committed to this strategy and policy. Uh, we brought out a paper a year ago on how to make India a low carbon economy. I think we're going to update that and work with this expert group. And thank you for uh, giving representation to industry in that group to, to work with you. Uh, time now for uh, questions. And uh, I'm going to turn to Ambassador Mahbubani, uh, head of the LKY School over here in front, please, <coughs> uh, from Singapore. Uh, thank you, Tarun. I I'm no longer an ambassador. I can now ask undiplomatic Absolutely. questions. <laughs> Thank you, Minister Jaram. That was a fantastic uh, and brilliant insight to what happened in Copenhagen, and I now finally understand what's really going on. I just have two questions. Firstly, why is it immediately after the Copenhagen, the British, on record, used the minister and subsequently the prime minister to say that China essentially wrecked the conference? Were they doing it on their own volition or were they doing it on behalf of the United States? And the second question is, what was, the other thing that's remarkable about this conference is the degree of cooperation between China and India in this exercise. But if you had to over, look at an overall audit, in what percentage was there agreement within China and India? In what percentage was there disagreement within China and India on environmental issues? Um, I think um, I was very surprised by what uh, the British did, but knowing what David Miliband did when he was in India, I'm not surprised by what his brother Ed Miliband did in London. You know, I think uh, uh, 
part of the frustration was that Gordon Brown had to negotiate with a vice minister. And sometimes with a minister, uh, not even a vice minister, but an assistant vice minister. So that must have rankled in the minds of the British. Um, and clearly, the British were... Anybody from the British High Commission here? I see Mark Ronick is here. <laughs> He's no longer with the British Diplomatic Service, so I can afford to be make a couple of home truths. Uh, the British clearly, clearly were playing many games. And they were trying to get their ex-colonies to agree to the 1.5 degree Celsius goal. And this was being resisted by China very, very vehemently till the very last. And I think part of the frustration was that the Chinese were simply not willing to accept this articulation of a global goal, which countries like, you know, Maldives and Grenada and, you know, all these countries were, were articulating very forcefully. Um, you know, I, I think this somehow, I was shocked and surprised by the intensity of the statements that came out. Uh, but during the Copenhagen process, there was a spat between China and the U.S. as well. But Ambassador, I, I'm on record as having said that Copenhagen is the first conference in which the Chinese have played a leadership role. They have always been content to hide behind the superior drafting and nitpicking skills of the Indians. But this time around, they were actually taking a leadership role. They were actually suggesting formulations. They were, you know, uh, were, you know, they were as articulate as any Indian could be, you know. Uh, and I think the way they called the basic group meeting in Beijing, they were the ones who took the initiative to call the basic group meeting. They were the ones who prepared a draft of a Copenhagen Accord in case some other country would come up with its own version of a draft. So they had gone to extraordinarily le great lengths to, uh, to show that they meant business. Now, why did they do this? I think one reason is that they, were under, they knew they were under the radar screen. That as the world's largest emitter, they would be called upon to show a certain degree of responsibility and sensitivity. But I have another reason. I have, my reason is that the economic downturn in the Western countries and the fact that the Chinese went through the downturn with 8% plus growth gave them the confidence to take the Western countries on their own terms. I think this is a new China. A new China has been born after the economic downturn. They have weathered that. They have confounded all critics of a bubble in China. Uh, and I, I, I think the first evidence of this was the way they handled President Obama's visit to China. Uh, they, they handled it with a great degree of self-confidence, in my view, and not agreeing to any formulation which the United States was willing to offer to them. So I think it marked the emergence of a new... Uh, approach of China to international negotiations. And I don't think that we have seen the last of it. I think we, we will continue to see a leadership role from them, you know, uh, not only in environment, but perhaps in other issues relating to global economic architecture oh, as well, and global trade perhaps at some stage. Uh, your second question, I think on India and China, you see, uh, let me say that I've come under great criticism in this country by two sets of people. One set of people saying that we should never do anything with China. And another set of people saying, why are you doing anything with China? Because Chinese are the world's number one emitters and we are very low. You know, uh, per capita we are number 60. In absolute terms we are number five. We are going to be a low emitter always. Why are we in a Chinese boat? And my answer to that was, that to the, to the China baiters has been that while an overall environment can be one of a deficit of trust, perhaps, we must, it is in our interest to develop avenues of engagement, niches of cooperation, which show that we can work together as a confidence-building measure. And that's why 
we entered into a partnership agreement on climate change we were the, china was the first country with whom india signed a partnership agreement on climate change on the 21st of october and and uh, ch uh, for china india was the first country for which with which we signed a partnership agreement so i looked upon this climate change thing not just as an opportunity for climate change cooperation but as a signal to the larger in the larger scheme of things that india and china are not natural adversaries that there are areas where we can work together now in climate change yes it's true that our emission levels are different uh, that china is today five times our emission levels roughly four and a half times uh, that gap might narrow a little as our growth picks up but still there would be a substantial difference but that did not uh, prevent us from uh, having uh, a similar position on all issues that i mentioned to you there was absolutely no difference the only difference i could sense and i got to be honest here the only difference i could sense was that the chinese were more fundamentalist when it came to international uh, reflection of their actions as opposed to say we was or i was because i think transparency comes naturally to the indian system you know what do we have to hide we are running an open system we are running an open government you have a right to information whatever we do is in the public domain parliament calls for it the media calls for it civil society questions you so i think we are more comfortable and the chinese perhaps took a longer time to come on board on the issue that i mentioned to you on consultations and analysis uh that's the only place where i sense that the chinese were a little you know uncomfortable but in the interests of the larger basic group in the interests of ensuring that we had an accord they went along uh i think that's the only area where i feel china was perhaps uh, a little uncomfortable but they also realized that they had to have some thing to give to the international community Uh, rather than their traditional position saying i'm going to do everything on my own if you want to know some, what i'm doing go on to my website and half the time you can't access their website anyway so you know you go on to my website and figure out what i'm doing that attitude has they realized that they had to change okay. and they put their best negotiators by the way i must tell you it's very interesting the chinese negotiating team was a foreign office negotiating team most of their negotiators came from the foreign office these people these were of people who were part of the g20 part of the mef part of the you know g8 plus 5 different international you know they were part of an international network so they were comfortable in in engaging the americans particularly they had their best american uh, you know civil servants who were trained in the united states uh, negotiating with the united states particularly Uh, and it, it showed in the manner in which they carried on these conversations mr siddharth shidam i am asking this i wanted to ask a question about what we have to do in india for instance people like me who are business people uh and we are operating in several states now my concern <laughs> is also environmental and climate change but what will be the road map for different sections of society including business including construction contractors etc and governments not only central government we when you talk about parliament quite a lot of it flounders where it gets down to distant states you know and whether at the end of it all there will be an annual or a periodic report card as we have to do i think that would be a good method of trying to get movement going on it well the uh, the agenda is you know quite comprehensive and quite amb ambitious but let me just say in the uh not in, not not getting on to the larger environmental agenda which is a separate issue but limited to the climate change issue i think clearly the most important sector on which we will be called upon to make choices is in the power sector uh because almost 55 anywhere between 55 to 60% of our uh you know co2 emissions are coming from the power sector alone um so you are talking of a very major shift in the way we use our coal for instance to generate power we are talking of a greater share for nuclear power you know nuclear may be red rat to the green bull but from a climate change point of view nuclear is a, is a good technology uh, 
suddenly there's a room for renewables but you know i don't think that a nation of a billion people adding 14 million people every year is going to have its energy requirements met through renewables renewables is going to have an important load and location a specific role to play uh, but nuclear hydro and certainly new coal based technologies which reduce CO2 emissions. These are the types of choices that will have to be made uh, between now and say the next five to seven years in order to meet our targets for 2020. The second very important sector in which you have been associated is the automotive sector. Today the transportation sector is not a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions, maybe five to seven percent at most. But the, the mad pace at which our transportation sector is growing, and I can only describe it as mad, uh, by the year 2025 or is a very major construction buildings is a major contributor to, to the greenhouse gas emissions largely through the use of air conditioning again in industry in which you have, you have been present uh, and now the use of building codes the use of you know legislation to drive green buildings now green buildings today are an exotica but hopefully in the next five to seven years with new codes with a proliferation of new uh, areas, you know, we have LEED, we have GRAHA, we have, you know, various types of certifications and ratings. We will be able to have buildings uh, where we can say uh, the carbon footprint is much lower than it would otherwise have been. So I think there is an agenda if you go sector by sector by sector in industry, for example. Uh, there is, we are, we are now, uh, the legislation is already in Parliament. Uh, in the budget session, the legislation will be passed. Uh, we are introducing some sort of a domestic cap in trade for energy efficiency, you know, in the energy intensive industries. A, a, a best practice energy consumption norm has been specified. And all those companies who are below that norm, uh, who are energy efficient companies, can sell certificates uh, to the laggards who are not able to meet those norms. And thereby you create an internal market based mechanism for promoting energy efficiency. So this working group that I, this expert group that I referred to is, has been tasked with actually laying out a sector by sector roadmap for what we have to do. But clearly power, transport and buildings are the three most important sectors where with the use of new technology, we can actually begin to make a difference. You know, McKinsey did a report recently, very interesting report which said that 80% of India's infrastructure required by 2030 remains to be built. And I think this is, a, this is the opportunity that is available to us. The new transportation technology that we are going to do, the new building technology, the new power technologies that we are going to use, this offers the opportunity for us. So, I think it's on. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Mr. <coughs> Ramesh, for a wonderful presentation. <coughs> I hope it puts to rest the allegation that in Copenhagen, India uh, surrendered to or fell for the U.S. Now, I have a couple of <coughs> questions. <coughs> one is, there is a very clear reference to the equity principle in both paragraph one and two, and that would be, of course, to India's advantage, and I hope I will. India might have contributed to this. So what I would like to know is, what is the definition of equity that uh, you might have in mind, whether it is per capita emission or per capita stock or so on, and how could we establish this more generally? Because it would have very favorable implications for India's space for growth. The second point is about the role of prices in carving uh, carbon emission. As economists, we feel that getting prices right is the first step, and perhaps the carbon tax should be seriously considered. What are your views on that? Thank you. Well, I, should have I should have mentioned that the word equity was actually India's contribution in that paragraph. So, I mean, I should have mentioned it, but you know, it was. Uh, now, what do we mean by equity? <laughs> in India, the only one definition of equity, which is per capita, but my friend, Professor Ma Dr. Mahbubani's country, vigorously objects to the per capita principle. In fact, every time I mention per capita, the Singapore uh, minister would say, why are you talking of per capita, minister? So I said, is it because it's to my advantage to talk about per capita. 
So uh, we are um, uh, we are uh, uh, leading the per capita charge, uh, and uh, the total number of countries leading the per capita charge is precisely one. Uh, we have, incidentally, the only su country that supports us is Germany. Chancellor Merkel supports us on the per capita principle, uh, being the uh, instrument to ensure equity. But this is not a view that is shared by the Euro Americans. It's not a view that is shared by the other Europeans. And it's certainly not a view shared by many Asian countries, you know, like, like, uh, like Singapore, as an example. But in our mind, when we say equity, we say we mean per capita. And our notion of equity is that, as our Prime Minister enunciated it, that our per capita emissions will never exceed the per capita emissions of the developed world. So if the developed world brings the per capita emissions down to, say, three tons per capita or two tons per capita, we will keep it below that frontier. There is no other, there is no other, there is no other instrument to ensure equity. Now, let me say one thing here, which I haven't said before. I think one of the great drawbacks in the international climate discussions in the last 20 years has been the absence of economic criteria. You know, and you are an economist, and you'll, you'll appreciate this. There is no mention of per capita income anywhere at any point of time, by any country. Uh, and I think at some stage we have to start talking of economic criteria. You know, a country that has a per capita income of $1,000 cannot be treated at the same manner as a country that has a per capita income of $10,000. And in the international sphere, the per capita income is generally accepted to be you know, the best instrument of measuring welfare, you know, whatever that means, entails. And unfortunately, this graduation criteria does not figure anywhere in international climate discussions. I don't think we can introduce it right now, but over a period of time, perhaps, we should start talking about some of these ideas. But on per capita, we, on equity, we mean per capita. And we, we are committed to the per capita approach. Now, I don't know whether we'll be able to embody this uh, in an international agreement. You know, internationally, we have been only able to get the word equity in. Our next thing is to ensure equity as measured by per capita emissions. But that will come in a square bracket, I'm sure, then. You know. Madam? <laughs> Thank you so much for your extraordinary talk. Um, I'm coming from that difficult country, the U.S., um, but, uh, but also from Yale, where Dr. Pachori has joined our faculty, as you know, for a climate uh, initiative. And at the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies there, we have a program um, that our last dean, Gus Beth, um, helped to inaugurate on uh, world religions and ecology, which we began actually at Harvard and is now based at Yale. And, Dr. Pachori and others are quite interested in this. And I'm bringing this up for a number of reasons, because of course we're here at the World Wildlife Center where religion and conservation with Prince Philip was strongly supported. Um, and last summer, my husband and I met with the vice minister in China, uh, Pan Yue, who's calling for an ecological culture based on values, including Confucianism and Taoism and so on, and has been speaking about this for some time, as, as you may well know. Um, so this is coming from a very different point of view, clearly from the extraordinarily important points you're making about economics and change of technologies and so on, but the values piece and the attitudes piece, um, and that these traditions will still be shaping world cultures for many years to come. And so the invitation is how can we bring them into this discussion effectively um, and, and with a sense that we are actually motivated by these values around the world still, even in modernity. So traditions in modernity, and I'd love to have your response for how these can be part of the discussion. Which well, I think you're preaching to the converted in India. Yes. Your constituency should be the United States and Europe, uh, because um, I think you know most traditions in India uh, elevate austerity, frugality, uh, you know, to godhood. Uh, perhaps too much, you know. A little bit of consumerism wouldn't do us a bit harm, 
once in a while. But I think in India you have a long tradition, you have communities you I'm sure you've heard of uh, who have had a long tradition of ecological uh, protection. Uh, you know, one of the things is that if you look at Indian emission levels, uh, income class to income class, if you take an Indian in an upper income category and an American in an income category, you will still see a 15-fold difference in emission levels. Now that is because of the way the Americans commute, the, the way the Americans use electricity, the, the beef that they eat, you know, a variety of things. You know. So, uh, frankly, you know, uh, the talk of to talk of religions and conservation, uh, I think you're you're you should be talking about this in Texas, not in India, you know, because that's where really the yeah, I mean, that's it's you know the and this goes back to the old debate, you know, which we have had, you know, India was the one which propagated this idea 20 years ago that Western emissions are lifestyle emissions, whereas Indian emissions are developmental emissions. So there is a fundamental distinction between lifestyle emissions and developmental emissions. You know, our per capita emissions 1.2, 1.3 tons, whereas the United States is 20. So uh, we are ultimately, if you're talking about it in terms of values, we are ultimately talking in terms of uh, lifestyles. In, in fact, there was a very interesting uh, proposal uh, put forward by Professor Sokolo at Princeton University uh, a couple of months ago. Very interesting, very innovative. In, one Indian physicist also was associated with that, where they said, let's not negotiate on the basis of countries. And that was the real pitfall in their proposal, because the ultimate reality is the nation state. What they said was 500 million people in the world account for 70% of emissions. So there is a lot of you know inequality in terms of emissions. Uh, and their proposal was to look at individuals as opposed to nation states, and clearly that was not on the cards. So there are people who are looking at this emission distribution uh, quite differently. But frankly, my answer to your question is, in this country, uh, you don't see the type of emissions that you see in the United States or you know, in some of the advanced European economies, because the structure of our mobility is different. The structure of our ownership uh, of durables is different. Recycling, for example, we don't call it recycling, but you know, uh, recycling is inherent in our in our work ethic. You know, so uh, we are uh, much more than us is the Western economies which require this type of. And I would say even China, I was very surprised actually. You know, uh, you look at the Chinese pattern. Maybe it will happen in India also. I'm not saying that you know, India is going to be immune to this. The last thing we should be is smug. Uh, but if we are going to be selling one million cars a month, as the Chinese are doing, we're going to have a problem. And we've got to wake up to that problem and we've got to you know, see how we're going to deal with that. And we're getting there, the way I gave you those numbers on automobile ownership. Because the moment you have automobile ownership, your patterns of living will change. Uh, and your patterns of living will change, then your energy patterns will change. Once your energy patterns change, your emission patterns will change. So I am not one of those who believe that India is going to continue to be a low emission economy. You know, in the foreseeable future, up to the year 2020, we will, you know, we will be, we are saved by our denominator. Uh, you know, and thank God for our denominator there. But uh, really, uh, the, in absolute terms, you know, we would be increasing very substantially our load on the international environment, and we will be called upon to take hard decisions. Maybe not now, but in the year 2020. Yes, sir. Uh, Shirish Sana from WWF. Uh, so come back on the Copenhagen Accord. Uh, there is a reference to uh, one setting up a high-level panel uh, to oversee the process. Where does that actually come up? Because if you look at the accord in itself and, and the UNFCCC process, and we kind of did an analysis to look at India's submission on UNFCCC and what is there in the elements of the accord, huge degree of differences in between two of them. So where does this leave the UNFCCC process? Where does it leave the <coughs> setting up of this high-level accord, uh, high-level uh, group altogether? It is only in the context of financing. And it was an idea to provide Gordon Brown a job after it, you know, if he loses the election, frankly. So this was an idea that came from the UK, and it was clearly designed as an exit policy for the British Prime Minister. <laughs> so it was a high-level panel. 
uh, and they, they will work out the modalities of the finance. You know, it's nothing to do with the accord. It's a high-level high-level panel for for financial matters. You know? How is the money going to be mobilized? What's the mix between public and private? Is it going to be bunker fuel? Is it going to be airline taxes? What are the sources you're going to get the money from? So all these details were left to a high-level panel. And I think you know this was a British idea, frankly, and one could see what was happening there. Um, and that's his core competence. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, to, to give him credit, he was the first one to actually put a number on the table, you know, yeah. six months ago. And uh, I think that they are, this is what the panel is going to do. I think the panel is going to be announced very soon. Uh, it's going to look at the mix between public, private. It's going to look at how much private is going to be generated from which source, how much money, and which are the what is the criteria by which countries should ha access this money. You know, who should get priority? Africa, small island states, you know, those types of issues. It's got nothing to do with the accord per se. Mr. Swadesh Chatterjee? Very much. And then I'll come to you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. I'm also from that difficult country, but I'm American of Indian origin, so I understand a little bit better. Now, Mr. Minister, first thing, I'm so impressed the way you described the position, what happened in Copenhagen. And I'm also very much impressed that your clarity about what India should do. I think, as you well know, that in the United States, the perception was that it is India who is really not playing the cards right in the global community. And now, it is perception that it is India who really brought the solution to the problem. So, India is now in a different level, and what you said is so right. I have got two questions. Number one is, the first time you have seen President Obama, when a, something like this crisis comes, how he handles the problem. So I want to know firsthand what is your impression, the way President Obama handled, number one. Number two, as President came back from China, as you know, the Congress and the United States felt that his trip to China was a waste because President Obama came back with nothing. So it is very important for President Obama when he come back from Copenhagen, he must bring something. As you well know, that has really helped a lot to really sign an agreement what happened. So if you can answer these two questions, I'd appreciate very much because I can tell you that President Obama's perception of India was much different before he became president than what it is now. So I just wanted to hear from you, Mr. Minister. Uh, president Obama clearly was, you know, the center of all attention as, as in when he entered the negotiating process. And uh, he was hands-on. Uh, he was very hands-on. He was negotiating directly, as I told you. He was the one who was negotiating, you know, on words. Uh, he was the one who was taking the decisions. He was not turning to some Sherpa and say, what do you think about it? Uh, and he took the decision, you know, and uh, he was quick. And he changed his mind when, you know, he was presented with an alternative. I give you an example of a word that he rejected. And five minutes later, when it was pointed out to him that consultations has a certain international connotation, he immediately bought it. Two things about President Obama stood out. Uh, I had occasion to talk to him thrice, and all the three times he said of how much he respected our Prime Minister. It always came back to that. You know? He always said that, you know, your Prime Minister is like a guru to me. He kept using the word guru. He's like a guru to me. And even in the meeting with the basic countries, his first thing would be, what does Prime Minister Singh have to say? You know, his first question, his first instinctive was, he would say, what does Prime Minister Singh have to say? So, clearly there was a lot of personal regard, personal respect for, for the Prime Minister, which was very much in evidence. Um, other than that, I think it was a very informal, collegial style. Uh, he, was, he was talking to everybody, he was negotiating. Uh, and that is what really impressed me, that he was actually doing the negotiating process, you know, and he was willing to take the call at critical times. Now, as far as domestic compulsions are concerned, you know, it was, you know, I, when his media advice, when his spin doctor, David Axelrod, you know, said, uh, Copenhagen Accord, we can hold India and China to challenge them. You know, our Indian press, many of whom are present here, went apoplectic, say, see, we told you, you sold out to the U.S., uh, and, you know, see what happened. Uh, so in Parliament also it came up. And then I had to explain that, you know, Axelrod is the spin doctor and he has got a domestic compulsion. He has to show 
that there is, by the way, I met 22 US congressmen, including Waxman, Markey, and Kerry uh, in Copenhagen. And they also were saying the same thing, that we have to go back to the United States with something, you know, which shows that China is on board. That was the whole game plan of the US was to have a piece of paper which bought China on board. And I got to tell you this, India bought China on board. If India was not there in that room, China would not have come on board. So the US actually owes us a lot, you know. <laughs> Uh, my name is Kanchan Chopra, still recently director at the Institute of Economic Growth in Delhi. Uh, I must say that I've been following the Copenhagen uh, process and everything that has happened there very closely. And uh, I do believe that it marks a watershed, as you said, in international uh, negotiations, but the negotiations are going to be long and hard. I don't see December 2010 really, maybe I am not so optimistic, it is really a question of lifestyles and that's the, uh, that's the website that needs uh, activation somehow, you know, the difference in lifestyles and if we call it per capita emissions to make it sound very technical, but uh, it's actually the lifestyle difference that and no, no U.S. president can go back and tell his country uh, to look at that. It's difficult. But India has an opportunity here, and that's what I want to uh, talk more about. The Indian opportunity consists in only 5% or so of the world's emissions come from India. And we need to get our domestic act really strong. And incidentally, this is what I said in a short piece in the Economic Times two years ago. I don't want to go back to quote myself, but we will remember that. But we have a difficult things to do, difficult things to do domestically, because the instruments that we are going to choose, law and then also economic instruments, have to be carefully, look, carefully looked at. Law is there. We've had many laws, some successful in the in environmental context, some not so successful. Uh, but I feel that laws do a great deal, so they should be there. But what about compliance? What about governance? We've had effluent treatment plants that are not run. Ma'am, we have to, like you know, that. to be watched the so time. So I will hmm. just sort of say that let us look at the governance issues. That's my main point on the domestic front. How do we get the governance right? How do we get the economic instruments right so that the disincentive from not following a law is more than the incentive yeah. to evade the law? Some such things have to be put in place. And... Uh, I do think that low carbon was something we talked about a year ago, but it was not really given. Mitigation was not talked about. And I'm really happy that we are now moving in that direction. And uh, that is all I would like to say. It's more a comment than a question. There are many questions, but I leave them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chopra. In fact, one of the most important economic instruments Dr. Chopra has been responsible for. Uh, she has introduced the concept of a net present value. And today, anybody who uses our forests for non-forest purposes has to pay what I can only call the Kanchan Chopra tax. Uh, <laughs> although it's called net present value. But thank you, uh, you know, for uh, her, her part-breaking work for the Supreme Court, which is really today enabling a large part of our forest cover, uh, you know, to be maintained. And we, that's the use of an economic instrument. Uh, we've had laws to maintain our forest cover, which are not effective, but it was thanks to her and her colleagues that an economic instrument was used. And I take your point, and increasingly, we must move from the command and control model of environmental governance to an incentive-based, disincentive-based model of environmental governance. This is going to require a huge mindset shift, because our traditional model is command and control. Have a law, have an inspector, have, you know, regulations, send them out, 
uh, and then you know you expect that the standards will be met. That is not going to work, and that is why increasingly I think we have started this in the area of forests, thanks to you. Uh, but we need to bring such economic thinking in the area of environmental management as well. In fact, one of your students uh, is working with us. Purnamita is working with us. One of your colleagues is working with us to design precisely the economic incentive instruments uh, to ensure that environmental governance improves. And I couldn't agree with you more when you say this. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Arjun Bhagat. I'm a journalist. Uh, uh, you know, I want to congratulate you on the fact that uh, you admitted on this forum that we have a terrible environmental track record, and I think that needs to be said uh, much more often than coming from the Minister of Environment. I think that is the first step. Uh, but coming back to the Copenhagen Accord, you said that we didn't really achieve the ideal uh, accord, uh, so as to say, so, so can you articulate one or two points that you would have liked? Uh, to have included in that accord that we might have said it is a success? No, all of us went to Copenhagen with the expectation that the post-2012 emission reduction commitments of the Annex 1 countries would have clarity. That we don't have clarity on today. So that was disappointment number one. Uh, disappointment number two was that I think a lot of the financial commitments uh, are in, you know, backloaded. 100 billion dollars a year will be mobilized, uh, and there's no clarity on, as I said, the public-private mix. How is the private money going to come from? And I would say that there is far too excessive a reliance on financial markets to develop, uh, to to generate this finance, as opposed to public funding of finance. Now, I believe, st I still believe that there is a role for public f funding here. Uh, and to, to expect that private financial markets are going to cough up the billions of dollars that are required is being somewhat unrealistic. So I would say these are two of my, two of my most sort of serious disappointments as far as Copenhagen is concerned. Mr. Subramanian? Yeah. Okay, How much did Copenhagen figure in the summit discussion between Manmohan Singh and Obama in November. Oh. Secondly, in that joint statement there is already a mention that the uh, voluntary mitigation actions of the developing countries should be brought on board and processes for that should be worked out. What happened in the basic Obama meeting is exactly that. So I'm only wondering whether this was a, a complete surprise to Obama and Manmohan Singh or <laughs> I think you're providing a very respectable fodder to all conspiracy theorists in this country. <laughs> Of which there is no shortage <laughs> who believe this whole thing was done. But uh, I think climate formed part of a uh, very important part of the negotiations uh, between President Obama and, uh, and Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. Although uh, I wouldn't say, I would say, you know, it, f it formed about 25% of the discussions. You know, it's not, it was not the driver of the discussions like it was between China and the United States, where clearly that was. 50%. 50% was currency and 50% was, was climate change. But in the case of India, it was not so much uh, climate change, but it did figure. Um, uh, no, I, but there was a recognition. I mean, these issues had been discussed. It's not as if these uh, positions were not known. These positions had been discussed. Uh, and uh, we, you know, there were negotiations had been going on for quite some time. Since August, we've been talking about this whole issue of monitoring, reporting, and veri me measurement reporting and verification. So yes, it did not, I mean, these were not new issues. Let's put it this way. These three make or break issues that I talked about, global goal, legally binding nature, and uh, the measurement reporting and verification were not new issues. But what was new was the manner in which they got crystallized, number one. And what was new was certainly the negotiating forum for resolution. The negotiating forum for resolution was not 194 countries, was not 29 countries, but five countries. That was new. 
Uh, and what was new, incidentally, Mr. Subramaniam, was it was not even two countries. It was not G1 and G2 talking to each other. It was not the US and China talking to each other. And every time G1 wanted to talk to G2, G2 would say, no, 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 please wait, I'm going to bring all my GX, GY, GZ, you know, which is India, South Africa, and Brazil. So this is very interesting. The Chinese refused to negotiate with the Americans at Copenhagen without the Indians, the Brazilians, and the South Africans. Uh, now, this I mean, no, in, that's why I said this is one area in which the Chinese were not willing to, you know, part with any uh, progress there. But they knew the Chinese also knew. Uh, they came to Copenhagen knowing fully well that this is going to be the issue as far as they are concerned and as far as Copenhagen is concerned. So it's you know, it was a game being played at different levels in different, uh, by you know, but, but the end objective nobody could anticipate that the four basic countries and President Obama would actually sit for 75 minutes and work out the template of the accord. That was not envisaged <laughs> even at 6 p.m. on the 18th uh, when the four heads of state met. First of all, they didn't expect President Obama to walk in. And secondly, <laughs> the way the discussions were going, it was unclear to me at least that we were going to have an agreement at the end of the, at the, end of the day. I mean, I was perfectly prepared for President Obama to go out there and say these four countries have stymied the accord. And in fact, our discussions was on what should we do to re preempt this criticism. We were discussing amongst ourselves how to preempt the finger pointing and the blame game. And none of us were actually discussing how are we going to project the Copenhagen Accord because we had written, the, written off the possibilities of the accord. There are many hands up. I promised you 90 minutes. Thank you for doing this. Uh, you scored a century. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand. Thank you. 